Warm and joyful greetings to you all today. Welcome to Nurture the Soul. I'm your host, Tracy Howe, team leader and minister for faith education, innovation, and formation, Faith Info for short, at part of Justice and Local Church Ministries at the national setting of the United Church of Christ. Nurture the Soul is a weekly webinar sharing practical, educational, innovative, and formational resources engaging critical topics for local churches and people of faith. It's produced by Justice and Local Church Ministries of the United Church of Christ, and we faithfully focus on care and education for the people of God. From cultural and community organizing to congregational leadership, from worship and theology to resourcing small and rural churches, from ministry with youth and children to wide ranging justice issues, we feature guest artists, authors, and key leaders and try to stay current on how the gospel is alive in this time. So this is our space for connection, community, and nurture, and together we can bring our church, our community, and world towards the world God imagines for us all. You can join us here every Thursday at 3.30 Eastern Standard Time and look for special offerings from time to time as well. We are always producing opportunities to engage and you can find a full list of upcoming digital program offerings at ucc.org forward slash events or on any of our social media platforms. And beloveds, if you are moved by these conversations, if you find these things are helpful and enhance your ministry or your soul, please consider donating towards the annual fund of the United Church of Christ by texting UCC to 41444. Your prayerful and financial support helps programs like this in the essential work of the United Church of Christ. Thank you and thank you. We're so glad to be together as we are now in the middle of our three-part series on security and faith in our local churches. We live in a world of increasing vulnerability, charged public rhetoric, and more and more guns. Local congregations are encountering threats to persons and property from their local churches where buildings are being vandalized, to pastors being threatened, to the greater community where white Christian nationalists are demonstrating against drag shows and pride festivals. What does security mean from a gospel perspective? What can we build together towards safety for all? Building off of community safety for all last week, this webinar will bring us into the commitments of the United Church of Christ. And we'll look at the years of general synod resolutions things supporting racial justice and gun control, and talk about how these things should inform our conversations and the decisions that we make about local church security. So leading us through our conversation and highlighting some of these general synod uh, resolutions is Katie Adams, our domestic policy advocate from the UCC Washington DC office. Katie, can you just say hello to everybody? Hello everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Uh, Katie's also a dear friend and colleague. But before we hear from Katie, I want to introduce uh, the Reverend Adam Erickson, pastor of Clackamas UCC in Clackamas, Oregon, um, in this critical conversation on embodying our faith and collective justice commitments in the context of increasing threats and vulnerability of pastors in local churches. And joining Pastor Erickson is Erica Baseda, a member of Clackamas UCC and a co-teacher for grades four through six at the church. Hello, Adam and Erica, welcome. Please introduce Hello. yourself a little bit. Hi, Tracy. Thank you for inviting us to be here today. It's an honor. And uh, yeah, we are at Clackamas United Church of Christ, uh, just outside of Portland, Oregon. And um, I, going along with the resolutions to be uh, a anti-racist uh, church uh, to be uh, affirming of all of God's children, including uh, most especially our LGBTQIA2 plus siblings. Uh, we decided um, five years ago that we would try to be bold uh, and get the message out there uh, as best we could. Uh, and we started getting phone calls from people living in other parts of the country, thank God, uh, trying to threaten us uh, uh, with uh, violence. Um, one person called and said they would bring a gun 
Um, and uh, we were kind of scared, <laughs> but the congregation um, continued to say, let's be bold. Let's live into uh, this Christ-driven uh, miss mission. And uh, since then, uh, we had the protests here in Oregon, and er Erica and I went. And the conversation last week with uh, Reverend Ann Dunlap was um, was awesome mm -hmm. to help me reflect upon that uh, experience uh, because it was there where we uh, met a lot of community organizers, mm -hmm. um, uh, black, brown, white folk. Uh, and developed relationships with them uh, in many ways uh, that continues today, especially with uh, Erica and many of uh, the folks that we met there. Um, and they helped us think through security uh, measures um, and things that we could do. Uh, and uh, that was really powerful. In the face of that, uh, we also, you may know that there are uh, Proud Boys, white supremacists uh, here in the Portland area. Uh, the place where we happen to live is much more purple uh, than blue. Uh, so people typically think of Portland as a blue area, but at the road uh, by us, uh, you can see folks driving with uh, the Confederate flag. Um, and sometimes when we have our, uh, our uh, so sort of marches outside where we're uh, protesting for a better world, uh, some some folks will drive by with um, the Confederate flag and yell out racial slurs uh, to some of our members, slurs that should never be used. Uh, and so um, the threat feels real. And so this conversation, especially as we're moving back, um, I don't want to say uh, from COVID, because COVID mm -hmm. is still a very real security risk that we have, a different kind of security risk. Um, but as we're moving into this phase, uh, these conversations are as important as ever. So thank you for, thank you for having this series. Uh, thank you for being here and, and sharing with us. I'm glad that you mentioned, you know, people think, oh, Portland, you know, mm -hmm. um, there's going to be lots of just progressive uh, people and faith voices, but um, that's, you know, speaking as one who's also from a, um, a city known for progressive policies, it's not so clear cut, is it? Yeah. Um, and you're not in Portland, you're on the outskirts where you've described it's a, it's a different feeling. And Oregon in general actually has um, a really alarming growing movement of extremism, um, violent extremism rooted in, in white mm -hmm. supremacy. Um, so when we, when I reached out to you, um, uh, Pastor Erickson, it, you know, I knew you because, um, your church has a kind of well-known Instagram account, uh, where you share, um, kind of, uh, messages, um, from week to week. Can you share a little bit about that? And I think you had an, I, I think one of your first, maybe what you would call a security incident was around, um, the sign even before the uprisings of 2020. I'm not sure where the timeline is, but let, tell us a little bit about um, your background and um, what what prompts you to be the ways in which you're public um, about your faith. Uh, well, um, I I decided that a lot of the reasons that liberal progressive churches at least I'm hoping that this is the reason that we're struggling is because we tend to be ashamed of our faith because the other Christians in the room are louder and uh, tend to be more known for what they're against than what they're for. And uh, I wanted to get the message out that there's a different kind of Christianity. Uh, and I thought the best way to do that in our local area was to get a sign and not just put on the sign uh, the sermon title <laughs> for this coming Sunday, but to put out there uh, messages that are in line with our uh, synod resolutions, uh, that God loves all of God's children, uh, uh, including our LGBTQIA2 plus children, uh, Black Lives Matter messages up there. Uh, and um, one of the first messages I put up there, uh, you may remember a previous president uh, who called a woman horseface. Uh, and I put up on the sign, uh, no one, something like no one should ever be called horseface, something that seems so obvious and moral and uh, good that you would teach your middle school, high school students, right? Um, and so I put something like that up on the sign. And instantly, like, 
uh, I had massive reactions uh, from typically women, uh, actually. And uh, the first one came down and said, how dare you put that up on the sign? Uh, this is political and um, was very upset about it. Uh, the next car that came down was a group of women who were like, thank you. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. This like, we need to get this message out. Um, and so that's kind of like the, the contrast um, that we're experiencing here. Uh, something that's so morally obvious gets turned into something political. Mm -hmm. uh, when has this ever happened? When it was a political message to uh, rebuke someone calling someone a horse face, right? It's just ridiculous. Right. But that's where that's that's where we are. Um, and uh, some of the some of the things that we've experienced uh, are some proud boys uh, um, uh, sending us uh, messages on our Twitter account that they're going to come and visit us on Sunday. Uh, or we've had some people come and uh, uh, throw eggs at the sign, uh, lock our, our uh, glue our doors uh, so that we can't use our keys to get in, um, things like that, things that have been uh, ways that we can manage it um, pretty easily. Uh, and one of the things that I learned right away, uh, our buildings and grounds guy, who is mostly our security uh, person who couldn't be here today because he's working the election, uh, but I was like, hey, I should post this on our social media. Like we, our sign got egged. It, isn't that so cool? Mm -hmm. Like we're doing something right. And he was like, Adam, don't highlight this. Like don't feed into it. Don't give attention to it. Uh, and I think that's one of the, the big things that I've learned uh, in this security stuff. I had thought about responding to the Proud Boys and saying, yeah, come on over. I'll bring donuts and we'll eat donuts together, right? <laughs> um, but I've just been like just just ignore it um but also prepare mm -hmm. for things that might happen but don't uh when i say ignore it i don't mean um don't prepare i mean don't feed into the beast uh but in a way that's like against uh but on but in a way that shows what we are uh for and i think that's what uh, helps uh, helps me uh remain true to what i think is the gospel message thank you um so another part of our conversation when we were kind of exploring whether you could be part of this series or not was just where you're at in terms of building a security plan. So um, you have uh, had several incidents and many more threats, um, but are being pretty transparent and generous by sharing on, the, on this webinar just the process of your ongoing conversation and bringing in other people who are part of um, building community safety plans, like, like Erica, I believe you have experience maybe doing this with, with schools and such. So can you share a little bit um, maybe about um, your experience, Erica, and um, where you're at in terms of conversation and the actual process? Uh, last week, we talked about um, the steps that are necessary towards actually having a robust safety plan, starting with assessment and then, you know, community resources, who's available, making, you know, a leadership team and a plan, and then actually practicing, um, you know, what, what would happen um, when um, a perceived threat is, is coming in and it, it, you know, that could look a lot of different ways. So what's your experience and what's that like in terms of the process at the church? Well, um, also, thank you for having me. My experience is that I have a freshman at a public high school. So the, um, the, the idea that I drop my child off at school knowing that they're, they're not necessarily safe and that um, the number one way, the number one cause of death among children right now is gun, gunfire. So it's, like just always there. And um, I'm a bit of a catastrophizer anyway. So it's um, not hard for me to imagine, like, what if this, what if this happens? And I had a therapist one time say, okay, what, what if that happened? What would you do? And just that one statement gave me so much power over the powerlessness, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so it's always in my head. And, um, and a few weeks ago when my co-educator and I were talking, um, he actually brought it up. He's an English teacher at a high school 
And he said the words, we need to have an active shooter drill, just like that. And I was saying, thank you. Thank you for being the one to say it. And um, so we started talking about it just amongst what I've been calling the faculty, because I think that Christian education is so important or faith formation rather is so important that we are actually educators. Um, and we just kind of put together this plan that um, for safety reasons, obviously I'm not gonna share online, but we have an idea of what we will do when or if something happens. And it's very simple right now. Um, and what I was surprised about when I brought it, when uh, Joel and I brought it to the board and, and I'm, I have a habit of speaking my mind like really clearly. <laughs> and I and I even watched my language and everything. I was really proud of myself. But I was like, we have to do this. We have to do it. And we need to be able to lock one door that doesn't lock. And, you know, this, so, and the, no one said no. You know, it, so I think at this point for Joel and I, at this point, and I've also spoken with, the two young people who teach the younger grades who are also both in high school and one of them includes my child. Um, so for them in particular and for Joel, uh, active shooter drills are like a daily thing. It, it's, it happened, you know, it's always in their head and children have been doing active shooter drills in school from, uh, for a long time now. And if your child is in uh, a head start at a public school, your child's doing drills. And they may not call them active shooter drills for preschool, but they're doing lockdown drills or lockout drills. So, you know, we're just kind of doing that. At this point, I say that we're in the prayer stage and then we'll get to the planning stage and then we'll get to the um, pre preparation stage and then the practice. And none of this happens overnight. Um, but I feel confident that our children right now are safe at our church. I would like to point out, and this is something that kind of brought the conversation in for me and Adam, when I asked our administrator to print out stuff, um, health and safety things, she printed out this like that. And there's nothing in here, not one word about church school, about the children, like, nothing. And I think that needs to change, you know, immediately. We need to have something very quick. Just this is, can you explain what this is? You this, can explain what it is. Uh, That's so a lot I, of work. This is from uh, UCC headquarters and it's a disaster preparedness manual for churches, which is great. Um, but Erica noticed there's nothing in here for like right. children or church school or something like that. Mm -hmm. So um excellent work for whoever put this together. And there are always things that we need to add and yeah. add to, to things. So, uh, yeah. But it is a, it is a critical oversight. You're right. And, um, I think part of what we hope to illuminate is, um, just how far reaching this, um, the need for safety and security is, but also how that relates, you know, um, Yes, gun violence is like at the top of our minds. What happens if someone comes in? Because then it's just game over. Um, but as we see the criminalization of those living without houses, um, police calls made for those having mental illness crises. Um, you know, there's there. You know, what does it mean if you've declared your um, house of worship a gun-free zone, um, but you want to call the cops when you know something is. Uh, something is going down. All of these things that we we don't um, we haven't thought through with care, and many churches like um, you all um, are part of bringing these important resolutions to synod, and then they get adopted by the denomination, and people um, kind of look for resources but don't think about the ramifications of what it mm -hmm. really means, and that's part of what. Anne, uh, Anne and I talked about last week, what are the ramifications if we are really wanting 
to create security and we've committed to racial justice or vulnerable populations. Mm -hmm. So this week um, we have uh, who I consider like the current um, staff expert on general synod resolutions, um, our policy, um, our policy, mm -hmm. our domestic policy advocate in the DC office. Uh, and every time I talk to Katie, um, I am just seeing, I'm seeing the connections between the general synod resolutions public policy that's being made law or that we want to be made law and like what's happening in our local churches. And so I'm hoping that um, she's just gonna help us uh, in this conversation, bring forward some resolutions that should be a part of our conversations around local church security and safety. And then we'll all talk together about things that we might learn or explore um, after this conversation. Does that sound good? All right, so I'll turn it over to you, Katie. Thanks, Tracy. I, I appreciate it. And um, thank you. It's It's been really um, helpful for me to, to kind of hear um, Eric and Adam, your perspective. Um, you know, when we're talking about abolitionist perspectives, um, I think that there's so much richness in general synod resolutions to, to turn to. Um, and so here in the Washington office, um, when I work on um, legislation or when we work on, um, you know, what, what, you know, policies and priorities do we want to support, we turn to our general synod resolutions. And so um, it's, it's important for us to have a, a deep understanding of what those are as our theological, um, you know, underpinnings and to give us the, you know, this is when we come together as, as the denomination and say, these are the things that are important to us. And, um, you know, they provide us the framework moving forward. And um, I always think it's really neat to go back through them because we've said some really cool stuff as a denomination. And, and we almost forget sometimes that we've said it, um, especially every, every synod, you know, we're, we're headed up into one and, in a you know, a little more than a month and, and people are like, oh, do we have a resolution? And I'm like, oh yeah, we already have a resolution on that. Actually, we, we, we did, we did one on that, you know, back in, in, in 1967, actually, um, you know, so I, I think it's really important to kind of ground ourselves in that um, because there, there's a lot more, I think, um, runway, a, a, lot, a, a lot more to go off of than maybe people think, um, especially when we're looking at this space of abolitionist perspective. So um, I, I have a, a little bit of a slideshow that I'm going to share. Um, with, with just some of the resolutions. Um, so Katie, before you move forward, yeah. with this, I realize we have not, um, uh, we have a great question in the Q and a, what oh, do you sure, sure, sure. Best word? I'm gonna stop. And I haven't actually defined that. Um, so this, uh, webinar was, um, titled abolitionist frameworks. And what that means is that the UCC is very, um, proud of its legacy, uh, towards freedom and thriving for all people. And we actually literally bring up abolition work um, when we reference the Amistad and our resistance um, to the enslavement of people prior to emancipation and to recognize that the abolitionist movement actually is still going on. It wasn't something that happened prior to the civil war and now it's over and done. That that actually is a legacy that um, continues and it's taken new forms. So when we talk about especially security and safety, we need to constantly ask ourselves, what does this mean towards our abolitionist goals of um, freedom and thriving for all? And, and there's a huge intersection between this effort and recognizing what is still um, systematized as violence towards specific people groups, um, black people, native people in our, um, in our criminal justice system, in our public policies. So thank you so much for asking that question. And with that, Katie, please continue. <laughs> Excellent. I'm just going to, um, pull up the slideshow again. Um, you as slideshow. Here we go. 
Um, so just, just like you said, um, the United Church of Christ um, embraces abolitionist perspectives to dismantle systems of oppression. Um, and the passage of our general synod resolutions are powerful expressions of that commitment. Um, and it's reflected across the history and the life of the church. So um, I did not pull all of the resolutions because we have a lot of them um, and we have a little bit of time. But I pulled some of the ones that I think are um, are really critical to talk about. Um, starting with, and I think that this is, um, you know, back to what um, Eric and Adam were talking about. Um, in 1985, passed a resolution on creating a world safe for children free from violence. Um, and I think that this resolution is really um, the basis for some of the, the future, you know, gun violence resolutions that we've um, passed since then. But I think it's really good for people to know that this isn't um, a 2023 conversation or a 2020 conversation. This is something that has been happening. And, and I just pulled from, you know, the, the past few decades. Um, I didn't. And, and so um, this, this isn't new. And um, so, and this recognizes um, kind of that there's, there's so many ways in which we can talk about what safety and security mean, because I think that the, bigger conversation of what what is safety and what is security is so tied up in um and and we get really stuck on um well but what if we don't have police then how will we be safe and and then then we get into a bigger conversation of well what do safe communities look like and so you know that's happening now with you know violence interrupters and happening now and and the language of this resolution I think is is prophetic and and um and I I will paste these in the chat when I'm done. Um I I apologize. I um I I'll do that after it. But go back and look at the language of these resolutions and they apply now. So this is um more recent. This is um dismantling the new Jim Crow and supporting all who are impacted. So um, the UCC um, articulated that, you know, they wanted to, you know, call out um, the new Jim Crow in, in a recent synod. And, um, you know, that's really where some of our sacred conversations on race have come from, you know, this resolution, um, and then endorsing policies that promote government accountability, um, and then opportunities for um, education, mobilization, our public witness on dismantling the new Jim Crow and calling out the disenfranchisement and marginalization um, that has, you know, been part of, you know, American society. Very close to that, because that part of this resolution talks about, um, you know, the, the plague of mass incarceration, but we have a whole resolution about dismantling systems of mass incarceration. And this affirms the commitment to restorative justice. And I think this is a great route for folks to look at. Um, again, it's an easy web to get caught in when we're talking about what does security mean? Because I think a lot of people can say, yeah, we need to have a more just society. But then when you kind of like, I, I know for me, when I've dug into, you know, my feel, well, well, but what about the people who do things that I don't like? Or what do we do about the, you know, I, I can look at it and be like, well, I wouldn't mind on that person where, but, but if you, if you really, you know, um, if you really want to talk about abolition in, in this way, then you have to, you know, apply it across the board. And so, this resolution um, really calls out the need to dismantle our system of mass incarceration. Um, and it is, it's, it's not, um, it's, it's, it's one of the greatest stains on, on America. And it is a continuation of our legacy of, of um, enslavement. And um, I think that the more people learn about mass incarceration, the more, a the matter you will get, um, and also the the more committed to to um, abolition movements you'll become. So um, we have a whole resolution around that. See, there's there's so much there's so much rich rich there's history so to draw. Much. We're so glad that you're 
taking us through this, Katie. Keep it coming. Keep it coming. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So we have a resolution in support of um, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and this expressly calls out police brutality, systemic racism, and law enforcement, community-based alternatives, um, and the conversation about demilitarization of police departments. So, um, and this is, you know, there's so much in the air right now around, again, what do safe communities look like? Um, right now I've been meeting with, um, legislators to talk about how do we appropriate more money to violence disruptors and in communities because we have so many great alternatives um and this is this is part of the resolution that I use when I go in and I say well the United Church of Christ has said these things um and then uh, more recently, another resolution calling for the end of for-profit prisons and detention centers and this isn't just um, for-profit prisons. Um, this is also immigration detention. Um, when you find out the the way that money is so intricately tied into our our prison system, then you'll then you'll really crack open the door on um, really understanding that this is all. Is it really about safety and security, or is it really about making money for people? Um, I think it's a really interesting. Um, you can trace back the former um, Secretary for Homeland Security under a previous administration is now on the board of directors for um, the largest, you know, private prison um, organization in the U.S. And one of the private prisons that runs um, detention centers for immigrant children. Um, so we're, you know, actively making money off of the detention of, of children. And the United Church of Christ has said that is not acceptable. Um, and so this, this is a great resolution for that as well. Um, and then this is a big, a, a big one. And the one I kind of wanted to end on because um, we have a great kind of, um, I love our resolutions that are for the common good. Um, or so this one is a resolution about, um, violence in our society and the world. And so, um, it's, uh, it's, it's a nice catch-all, uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, so that's, um, you know, we have to, to really look at, um, you know, how we interact with, with violence um, and and what we are saying about what kind of society we want to create. So um, there's just a little a little sampling of some of the resolutions that we have, and um, I'll pop the I'll pop those links into the chat. And um, I also Tracy in our conversation about this, I wanted to call attention to some of the other um, some of the other ways that the UCC has envisioned a just world, right? We talk about um, a tax system that um, is fair and equitable. We talk about, you know, making sure that people have access to healthcare. And so it recognizes the interconnectedness of all of this. I always... um, I always kind of poke people and say, don't say intersectionality, find a way to explain what you're saying when you say intersectionality. Um, because, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a catch all phrase that kind of we like to throw out. But I think when you look at our resolutions, there is a through line of how do we create a just world for all. And we have so much backing us up. So as you, you know, embark on the conversation of, you know, how do we how do we talk about safety and security in our local churches and our communities and writ large the U, the UCC has so many like rich wonderful resolutions to help guide that work so i hope that was helpful um and sorry if i rambled a little bit i do get excited talking about about our resolutions um and I'm happy to talk more about it and um, share, you know, more about the work that we're doing in the Washington office kind of around this as well. So yeah, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. That was really rich and gives us a lot of um, 
uh, soil through which to now um, seed and nurture perhaps um, our own steps and journeys. Um, I have, there's like several questions. I'm not sure where to start. I guess one thing I just want to acknowledge is um, that although I agree with you, Katie, that we have a lot of clarity and vision on what a just world can look like and that our resolutions are geared towards that. Um, there is not a lot of practical information on building those alternative systems that will require it. So yeah. for example, I believe there's a resolution up for this coming summer about um, to stand against uh, white nationalism and extremism. Um, so you have one, this on one side, violent extremism and, and white nationalism, and then we have all these other things that would lead us towards not, um, not like pretty much, di you know, not taking part in these violent systems that we're trying to actually dismantle that include um, policing and mass incarceration. But what if there's people here that are like live threats that really shouldn't free roam? Um, we, there are systems, there are, there are imaginings, there are ways, um, and there are very practical ways, but they, they require community commitments, resolves, yeah. and resources to build. And so one thing you, you know, you um, talked about was violence interrupters. Can you please tell, explain a little bit about what exactly that is? Sure. Yeah. As like one way. Mm -hmm. Well, um, so, and, and I'm, I live pretty close to Baltimore. I'm here in Washington, DC and Baltimore is one of the places where violence interrupters have had um, really positive success. And um, so this is, this is a program that what I'm particularly talking about in particular receives federal funding, tiny federal funding. We're trying to get more. Um, and this is using folks from the community to, um, to step in. And often people who have been a part of, you know, the community that they're speaking to. And so um, to, to go in and mediate and provide um, a resource as opposed to bringing in law enforcement. And I think you may have, um, if folks have been watching the news about, you know, ways that, you know, we can think differently about policing. Um, in some places that has involved, you know, um, providing mental health professionals if there are, you know, um, those 911 calls. And that looks like, you know, training people um, to be mediators as opposed to, um, you know, again, involving law enforcement. Um, there are a lot of systems that exist and a lot of thinking that exists. Um, and you're right, it involves political will and it involves community buy-in. And so the conversation we're having right now, um, and in fact, um, some of my colleagues are in one right now um, that I'm not joining um, with the appropriations committee, um, is saying when Congress appropriates money, um, you give a lot of money to militarizing the police and buying, you know, weapons of war for the police. And, um, you know, you should also give money to um, community based programs like this. Um, I There's a lot of education that needs to happen because there's a lot of fear. Um, and I always come back to, you know, um, you know, there is no fear in love because, you know, love drives out fear and that as our kind of guiding principle. Um, I mean, there's a lot of other conversations about what prison systems could look like that are more just. Um, and so I think, um, the political will, but also the imagination, um, to see that. And we're so stuck in like the world that we see right now and without allowing ourselves to imagine it. And we don't have to imagine that far. They exist in other places. We, we can, you know, do that research and borrow them. Absolutely. And one thing that, um, is, is, uh, people don't, the, the design of incarceration is that we don't, we've so um 
you know, through, through movies, TV, media, it's like the um, inhumane conditions and the violence that occurs within the carceral system becomes part of the punitive system right. for some reason. Um, and that is horrific. Yeah. And also because of our cash bail system, we have so many people that are subjected to violence um, that may not actually have done anything, you know, I don't even want to say to warrant it because I don't think anything warrants it. Right. But when we, what our current system does, even for violent offenders, it, it might remove them from a part of society, but they are actually free to continue to commit violence within our carceral system. It just now is put upon those who are in that system, right. which by and large are poor um, poor people and people that are already vulnerable, um, through, uh, you know, the color of their skin or, or their situation. So right now our system is not stopping violence and, and that's a huge violence, thing to realize about violence. why, why I'm an abolitionist, why I believe the gospel is abolitionist is because our current system of security and mass, it does not stop. It doesn't stop violence. So even if we have people who might not be safe, you know, to just like free roam, there, there's imagination for what res restoration can mean. And I'm it doesn't, it yeah, doesn't stop violence, but it also puts a scar on our society, right? Absolutely. Like we're, we are part of a society that, you know, puts people in, in prisons and, 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 you know, the U S we still have capital punishment, Right. Like, and it does, it denies our humanity. Um, and so I think that, you know, yeah, there, you know, Surge was on last week, can talk much better than I can. Um, but I, I think that there's, um, yeah, I'll, I'll let other people talk now. Um, I, I do love talking about this very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I really want to bring it back to the local church in process, which is why we have Erica and Adam here. Um, so you tell us a little bit about your um, commitments as a community, because you already seem to have um, really well uh, theologically based um, commitments to like LGBTQIA folks. And then all of a sudden you're, you know, you're having these incidences. Like, did you ever call the police when all these things you described happened? Do you, do you have a policy at the church about guns? Like some of these related resolutions, can you give us a little bit about what's surrounding you at the local church and now how you might like, what are, what, what is this bringing up for you as you move forward? Yeah. When we got the phone call threatening us, uh, I called the police right away. Uh, that was five years ago or so. Um, and uh, they did a search, found out the guy lived in a different state and had been making these threatening phone calls to progressive churches throughout the country. Um, and uh, that set us a little bit more at ease. Uh, but um, we do have a uh, no gun policy at the church. And one of the things that you are all, uh, that your conversation, this conversation is helping me realize is how much of our country uh, promotes violence, uh, promotes violence as the way to solve our problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is anti-gospel. Uh, when Jesus uh, is threatened uh, by the crowd, he doesn't say, uh, I'm going to get you guys and zap them with divine lightning bolts. What he does yeah, instead yeah. is he walks through the crowd. He doesn't engage. And I think one of the things that we in our culture, in our churches need to do so much more of is developing tools of uh, de-escalation, of nonviolent communication. Uh, we just started uh, a couple of weeks ago, we have a, a Zoom uh, session every Monday uh, on spiritual videos, religious videos, and we did a three-part series on uh, nonviolent communication and de-escalation techniques. Um, and uh, that was helpful. And I we're going to do more of that uh, here at the church. What do you do when someone comes in and is threatening you? Uh, right now, our plan is run, uh, get out of the building as fast as you can. Um, and if you can't do that, hide. 
Uh, and if you can't do that, then do whatever you can to uh, throw Bibles, throw hymns, uh, start confusion, do whatever you can to try to stop this person. But one of the things that I would love to add to that is, can we start with acts of nonviolent communication? Can we start with acts of de-escalation? Uh, or can we have some people who are trained in this uh, to, I don't know, be a point person or something? Because um, oftentimes, um, you know, God forbid anything happen, but are there ways in which we can de-escalate the situation? Our culture doesn't train us in that. Our churches typically don't train us in that because we don't know how, um, because we are inundated right. with the way to solve violence is through more violence. Um, right. And how do we enter into a gospel situation with that? So, yeah. And uh, so much happens Adam, when, when um, you know, this is, this is uh, constantly being evaluated within the system of policing, when you're constantly trained to perceive things as a threat and you have ways to, you know, uh, counter that, that's a very like first <laughs> human obvious thing that happens. And so how do we change perception? And perception to me is related to spiritual formation. Perception is, um, uh, I've, I've said this before, it's like, do you, I'm of a certain age where I had the, you know, the, the red and blue 3D glasses at a 3D movie, you know, the paper ones, mm -hmm. um, where one was red and one was blue. Um, and if you uh, just wore them and like did normal life, things just kind of appeared with a red tint. And if you took them off, you, you all are, are, um, are nodding your heads. Do you remember what happened if you took them off after wearing them for a while? I think our eyes were blurry. Well, they could be, but <laughs> you continue to see a red tint. Yeah. Yeah, There's no physiological reason that we should see that. But what happens in our brains is neural, neural connections are made very quickly and it lasts. And so when we are perceiving things and taught that violence is, you know, the way you're absolutely right. And I, I want to address a really important question uh, in the Q and A about mental health. Um, and so, so many, you know, like uh, a lot of folks. Part of the assessment in the toolkit that we um, learned about last week was just know who's coming in, who's, you know, maybe you're in a setting where people um, who are experiencing. Um, houselessness who by and large have, you know, they might have addiction or mental health um, issues um, are, are a, you know, have access to your, to your place. Um, if folks aren't actively engaging those populations all the time, it's very hard to recognize what's a mental health thing. What is just, you know, what's going on. And when we call armed, um, an armed system that only knows how to like criminalize or not, you know, they're not trained for mental health and de-escalation. Um, that can be a very, very bad scenario. Uh, mm -hmm. There are um, organizers who have actually set up hotlines in lieu of having to call like 911. There's alternative numbers and those are different and according to where you live. So you might be able to do some research online and find out if there's a rapid response number for a mental health crisis. That's what you would look for, a rapid response, first responder for mental health crises. Some municipalities have actually set those up on their own. And so you'll find that as at a governmental system. But even if that doesn't exist, there might be a mutual aid group. There might be um, just like um, volunteer mental health experts who are willing to go out into the community. There might be other ways to um, address that. Uh, so, um, and yes, uh, I see, um, Vanessa, you, you're, uh, you have a comment. You can establish them if they don't exist. Actually, this is something mm -hmm. that can be yeah. done. We actually have the power, Eric, as you said, we actually have the power to do some of this stuff, to manifest some of this stuff. And, um, you know, it is incredibly vulnerable in an age of guns. Uh, and so I just want to speak what is not spoken often enough. And that is, we have to know what we are rooted in and why will we will show up and, and choose the actions that we will. Mm -hmm. And um, if you are one who um, can be a first responder, who is someone to a who is able to like 
go up and, and actually put your body close to someone who is unknown, an unknown actor who, um, you know, you don't know their story, but they might be a threat. That is a love. That's a level of vulnerability that should be chosen and, um, trained and all those kinds of things. And if you are a caretaker for a number of people, maybe that's not you and that's okay. And you know where you're supposed to be when that threat comes, but, um, there is a way for us as a community to say, you know, I'm willing to take on this level of, um, risk for the sake of, uh, community security and safety. And, uh, and, and that level of risk might include having my affairs in order and speaking, um, up about, you know, what's important and why I'm going to make the choices that I do, because we do live in an, in an age where things are, it, the stakes are very high. Um, and from organizing I'm a part of and just living in the world with, with you all, um, I know that. And, um, and so I just want to encourage, that's why we're having these conversations. It's not easy. It's not as easy as just because we actually are, are building a world and um, embodying our faith. Exactly. Uh, so with that, I'm going to ask for you, yeah, go ahead and offer responses and kind of closing thoughts, questions, responses. If anyone else has a Q and a, please offer it up. So for me, um, the summer of 2020 was life-changing. Adam and I were down there several nights a week and, um, seeing firsthand the, um, the way that the Portland police bureau handled things just it was awful. There was one time, there was one time we were playing volleyball with blow up beach balls from the Dollar Tree, playing volleyball, nothing's going on. And the Portland Police Bureau called an unlawful assembly. I mean, it, it, so, so experience like that have forced me to not trust law enforcement. So I've, there's been more than one occasion where 10 years ago, I would have called 911. And now I'm like, nope, not going to do it. I'm just going to stand here and make sure this person's safe or whatever, but I'm not calling law enforcement. And the, the shame of not being able to teach our children, oh, you see the police person, the policeman, you're always safe. That's who you go to, you know, is it's revolting and terrifying and infuriating. And all those things. Yeah, it's it's one of the reasons why um, this this whole con conversation about uh, defunding the police is so important. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, uh, it gets misunderstood. Uh, we, if we want to be compassionate towards police, we should not put them into situations where um, they are in a place where they are going to escalate because that's mm -hmm. what they've been trained to do. Yeah. Uh, they've been trained that violence is the way to solve problems. And so if we can find other uh, resources, as you've been talking about, um, uh, other people that can help us in these situations de-escalate domestic uh, conflicts and uh, other areas, that would be great for our police uh, as well. Um, the other thing that I want to say about mental health is we are in a situation in our culture where those of us who experience with mental, who have it, forms of mental illness are being scapegoated uh, by this whole conversation. If those of us who have mental illness are far more likely to experience violence against us than we are to commit violent acts mm -hmm. against others. This is just another way for our culture to blame a minority group, uh, a vulnerable group, uh, for the problems that we have, unless, and I'm not comfortable doing this, unless you, we say gun violence is a mental illness <laughs> in our culture. Um, uh, but we're not going to do that. Um, so I, I just want to be careful when we're talking about mental illness in this whole conversation uh, when it comes to gun violence. Yeah, thank you. Um, you said something there about um, defunding the police. The, the movement for Black Lives which Katie has established, we, we support as a denomination through General Synod resolution actually has a comprehensive platform as well for policy that includes education, um, healthcare, immigration reform, all these things, and um, funding Black futures. And if we mm -hmm. expand that just to say, 
you know, um, to put it in the positive, like what are we trying to build? We're actually trying to resource futures for our children. You know, that's what we really want to do. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, Katie, any closing questions or um, reflections here for us today? Well, I just appreciate getting the chance to, to hear, you know, local pastors perspectives um, and think that there's a, yeah, this, this is an ongoing and, and challenging conversation, one in which I've had to challenge my own assumptions, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, um, I hope that folks can find um, guidance in the commitment from our general synod. And I really encourage a, a deep investigation into what we've already said as a way to guide what we say in the future, right? Um, the prophetic statements of our general synod and, and folks who have come in the past help encourage us for, um, you know, future conversations. And I think we can be em emboldened and encouraged by that. So really appreciate um, the chance to be here and, and share what's happening. Thank you. Um, so uh, to close out, we'll, we'll take a comment from someone who's joining us. Um, Vanessa, thank you for sharing. Um, she says that uh, her son is actually an NYPD sergeant and reports the majority of his time is addressing people in, mem in mental health crises. And you have a wonderful question. Um, uh, how can tr the church organize to make itself available as a mutual aid um, community um, is how I'm reading that. And that's a beautiful question. And I actually think that our congregations and our local churches are um, incredibly positioned to be communities of mutual aid and care, that that primarily is what maybe we are. Um, uh, if we look at, uh, you know, our legacy from the early church and, and moving forward. So we're about to stop this webinar and that is a beautiful question. So I just want to, um, tell you again about the forthcoming book that's coming out, building up a new world, uh, congregational organizing for transformative impact from Pilgrim Press. Um, it will be launched, um, and available on all the platforms where you can, uh, find books. It's actually available for pre-order already um, anywhere that you buy books. Um, and we have a, a whole section on that, on building community aid or uh, mutual aid within the churches and how um, our churches already have resources to do that. So maybe we'll explore that in another series because it's so related. Um, Tracy, can, I say a then, quick word about mutual aid? can I say a quick word about Please. mutual aid programs? Uh, um, we had a bunch of fires here in the Portland area a couple of years ago. And in our work at the protests, we met um, anti-fascists uh, who were really hard at core on mutual aid. Uh, and they contacted us and were like, hey, can we use your property in order to provide clothing uh, and any other items that people need who are trying to escape these fires and living in their homes. And we said, of course. So we had a bunch of anti-fascists in our front lawn <laughs> giving out free food, free water, free clothing, uh, diapers uh, mm -hmm. to anyone who is in need. And we were working with them uh, to do that. And so I think when it comes to like mutual aid and working with other groups, some groups will seem like uh, they are not natural fits for churches, uh, but actually they are. <laughs> they are living, the Holy Spirit works however she will. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it often works through mutual aid and people who are not involved in church who might even think of themselves as atheists. And they are wanting to work with other organizations, including churches, in order to get their mission accomplished. So uh, I would just say, don't be afraid to reach out to folks who are doing mutual aid uh, in your area and see how you can team up together. Absolutely. And that just the, the, the term mutual aid has really risen in public consciousness um, in the age of COVID. But I live here, you know, along the U.S.-Mexico border where mutual aid has been going on for uh, generations. And so it's um, really just a creative way to learn to care for people and provide and meet needs um, um, based on um, mutuality and humanity and um, community care model in spite of violent systems that we're trying to dismantle or transform. 
So let that be a word of hope to you all. Um, and thank you so much, um, Pastor Erickson, Erica, uh, Katie, and our, um, in our Washington DC office. This has been a wonderful conversation. I'm so grateful for you all. Uh, join us next week for the third part in our series. We're going to um, have um, a couple of local church um, uh, leaders, one a lay leader who's been a part of setting up a security, um, a really comprehensive security plan, and another um, Jess Peacock, who is part of Chesterfield United Church of Christ, who recently um, they had mol Molotov cocktails thrown at them and, um, and still went forward and um, were able to do pride celebrations and such, but that was um, a little bit complicated. So we're going to continue the conversation, learn from them, um, and look forward to seeing you all as well. Be blessed into your day. May you be held in the security, comfort, and love of the living God. Amen. Siblings in Christ, if you were moved by this conversation, if what's been offered here has helped enhance your ministry or has nurtured your soul for the journey, please consider donating to the annual fund of the United Church of Christ by texting UCC to 41444. Your support will help to provide programs like this, which are an essential part of our ministries in the United Church of Christ. Thank you for your support. Be blessed on your journey and know that you are not alone. We are holding you in prayer. Amen.